And right now I feel like I'm staying in a little Parisian apartment because it is so hot in here and I don't have an air conditioner. So enjoy this episode of me getting cooked alive in my home baking oven, which is my apartment. Now with the entire internet culture of sharing, I mean, you have Goodreads, you have stuff on Instagram that guides you towards certain art or guides you towards certain authors and painters and artists that, you know, these are people that you're basically supposed to like. These are people that you feel guilty about not reading. You know, these are people that you kind of like, you're supposed to read these people. Otherwise you're gonna risk looking stupid or, you know, you have to read these books to be a part of this community or whatever. And that's gonna bring us to the first point of this video, which is, I believe, there are two categories of art. And these two categories are art that you're supposed to enjoy and art that you actually freaking enjoy. So how do we navigate through these deep waters? How do we navigate through these very complicating contradictions in the art world? You know, there are pieces that are granted the status of masterpieces, but actually, if you read some of these pieces yourself, you might find them boring. If you look at certain pieces of art that you're supposed to enjoy, you might find them, you know, tasteless. In an age of information overload, how do we trust in our own tastes? How do we trust that what we like is what's supposed to be good for us? And like many of my videos, I got three points to present in this video. Point number one, no one gives a damn about your taste. In my recent scrapbook article, which is a scrapbook that you should follow if you like my work, in the opening I basically said, sometimes we pretend to like artists and writers just to sound impressive. But in my experience, no one gives a hang about your taste. At the end of the day, you should be the only person who gives a hang, since you're the one consuming their art. How many books have you slogged through just because it's on your Goodreads recommendation list? How many classics did you have to suffer through in high school just to write an essay on it? We live in an age where every living person's basically trying to grab our attention. We live in an age where everything's about marketing. Everything's about putting something on a front cover. Everything's about reporting a writer's death. And after the day of their death, well, their books end up, you know, flying off the shelves like hot pancakes. Basically, what I'm trying to say here is that you can't trust anyone anymore. You can't trust reviews. You can't trust this or that because there's always a marketing motive behind every promotion. And I do really think that the one thing that you can trust is basically your internal compass. It's basically your sort of emotional reaction to a certain piece of art, to a certain piece of music, writing. Because when you talk about these pieces in front of other people, for example, you go on a date with someone, for example, you hang out with your friends, people are not gonna be interested in analytical analyses of how brilliant Chekhov was or how brilliant Marcel Proust was. What people really respond to are passionate debates or you talking about something that you're really passionate about, you talking about something that really captured your attention. You know, that piece of art that really saved you from a dark place, that piece of writing that really inspired you to write or that piece of social criticism that really inspired you to start observing the world around you. I caught us the dinner table test. Next time, talk about whatever you're reading or whatever you're consuming in art world or whatever you are listening to on Spotify and notice your reaction when you're talking about these things. Notice your own personal reaction to these things. Are you talking about it in a very analytical sort of way or are you talking about it because you actually love the thing? In case you find yourself analytically, or should I say logically, justifying why you love a certain thing, that's probably a sign that you don't love it enough to really give emotions to it. But if you find yourself unable to shut up about the thing 24 seven, if you end up talking about Miles Davis like it's the best thing in the world, or if you end up ranting about a book around a clock, that's probably a sign that you are actually invested in that piece of work. So use the dinner table test to your advantage. And that's a really good, you know, surefire way to find out what you're actually attracted to, what piece of art actually clicks a chord in you, or which pieces of art are just kind of there for you to pretend that you are this person with great taste. At the end of the day, no one cares about your taste. So keep it to yourself and just consume what you enjoy. The second point that we need to talk about is the process of finding these artists or these musicians, these writers, these whatever, because if you're a creative yourself or if you're interested in consuming creative ideas, you know, it's there's so much out there to consume. How do you pick and choose what to consume? How do you pick and choose which book to read from these thousands of books that were published each year? Thousands of pieces of music that were released every year on Spotify that you're trying to, well, trying to educate yourself with. And for that, let me read you a quote from Marcel Duchamp. I don't believe in art, I believe in artists. And in the book, Steal Like an Artist, which quickly turned into one of my favorite creative books of all time, Austin Kleon basically said, if you try to devour the history of your discipline all at once, you'll choke. 
Instead, show on one thinker, writer, artist, activist, role model you really love. This is really going along the theme of finding emotional resonance in art. Finding emotional resonance to artists, thinkers, philosophers, activists, blah blah blah. Is that you need to basically narrow down your focus to one specific writer who you really love. And then use that writer as a reference point or use that artist as a reference point to track down their influences, to track down who inspired this writer here, who inspired Truman Capote. And then when you read all of Truman Capote's work, you realize that art just wasn't created in a vacuum. Truman Capote had many other influences. And then there you are, because you respect Capote so much, you end up reading all of these other writers that Capote himself read. And that's, in a sense, how I ended up discovering Andy Warhol. Because at the start of the year, I fell in love with Truman Capote's short stories. And after doing some background research on Truman Capote, I found out that Truman Capote actually had a pretty devout stalker. And the stalker's name is basically Andy Warhol. I knew bits and pieces about Andy Warhol's work, but I wasn't exactly invested in the guy. But after reading stories of Truman Capote, after reading a few novels of his, I basically went down the rabbit hole of researching Andy Warhol now. So that led me to reading this one, Warhol, Andy Warhol's biography right now. And that basically created the secondhand obsession with Andy Warhol's work to see what he's really like, to discover what he's really all about. So second step, in summary, Look for one artist, thinker, activist, whatever, and then use that as a reference point for you to track down many other thinkers, for you to track down their influences because art doesn't come out of a vacuum. Art is, in a sense, a process of multiple influences and you, as a person who's interested in this piece of art, this piece of writing, track down the artist's influences, track down the influences of their influences and in that way you can build yourself a really cohesive net of some of your favorite pieces of art and pieces of writing. And last but not least, this is probably my favorite thing, wander around bookstores or museums. Fran Leibowitz in her series, Pretend as a City, basically talked about this loss of discovery. The sort of sense that we no longer just heading to a bookstore and just go, what's this? What's that? We no longer offer ourselves that spontaneity to really go explore things. We no longer offer ourselves the freedom, the creative freedom or the intuitive freedom to like things that we're supposed to like. We have to read a review of a book on Goodreads before buying a book. Instead of just heading into a bookstore and buying a book on the spot. Some of my favorite books actually came from accidental discoveries. For example, this story collection by Truman Capote. Do you know how I ended up getting this book? It was around January and I went into a bookstore and I was sort of distracted by many other things out there. And it was so warm and I have this terrible habit of layering up even, even when it's warm that I ended up sweating like a crazy person in the bookstore. So when I opened up this book, when I flipped to a, to a certain page, it's, it was a really good story and I was immediately hooked by this book. And what ended up happening was that a, basically a sweat drop dropped on that page. And I thought to myself, shit, now I have to buy this book. Now I can't not buy this book because technically I've just tarnished a piece of perfectly well-conditioned book. So I ended up buying it, ended up reading it, ended up loving the book. And that's how I ended up discovering Truman Capote. So in summary, open yourself up to similar sweat dropping experiences to allow yourself the process of discovering work spontaneously. Not just looking up a list on the internet before you head into the bookstore. If you want to do that, you might as well end up ordering a book on Amazon. Wander through a big bookstore, read the first paragraph of 10 plus books, and then buy one on a whim and then read it and see how you like it and then decide from there. So, in essence, that's the master formula for rediscovering your internal artistic taste. So this is basically the process of how you can turn yourself into a more interesting person by not conforming to the taste of 20,000 other people out there. And also this process allows you to actually enjoy whatever it is that you're reading instead of having this anxiety looming over you 24 seven. Anyhow, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to follow me on my blog, which is a scrapbook where I post my little insights on creativity, art, literature, and so many things. And I hope you have enjoyed this video and I will see you in the next one. Take care.